Yep, we're live on YouTube now. We've got a handful of apprentices here with us. And uh, we may have some guests stop in, not sure. But either way, I am prepared to go solo. And I'm counting on you, YouTube. I'm going to pull you up so that way I can read your comments too. Counting on you to comment, ask questions, and generally be difficult the way that you always are. But that's why we love you. You know, you wouldn't be YouTube if you weren't a little difficult. Okay, let me just make sure that I got that open. All right, good. There's already 48 of you there. So as you enter on YouTube, just say, hey, say, say what you're working on today, where you're from, that kind of thing. And, uh, and we'll get rolling. So today we're going to be talking about charging practices and common mistakes. Um, you never can talk too much about charging, right? I mean, it's something that Everybody always wants to learn more about. Some of you may think that you know everything there is to know about it, but I can assure you, you do not. Um, obviously, when I talk about uh, anything, I'm usually focusing on air conditioning and more residential air conditioning, but we can talk any direction you want. So if you've got questions, um, we can talk about larger equipment uh, if you like. A lot of these principles uh, are going to, most of them actually, are going to hold true for most equipment, um, at least to some degree. And I always like to back it up and uh and talk about the principles more than just the specifics so i oh mean we got a lot of people coming in here matt and calvin and arturo and more calvin and franco and jeff from sandusky good old sandusky you know that is a good it's a good name for a town just gotta say jared's here so yeah all kinds of good stuff pedro so uh yeah come on in tell your friends uh, post it on Facebook. We're going to be here the next two hours. So you can pop in and out as you like. Um, but if you want to go on some of the groups and let people know that we're live uh, with the link, that would also be awesome because I did not prepare anybody for this <laughs> in usual fashion. But I think I think you're going to enjoy it. I think there's going to be some good stuff. So here we go. Charging practices and common mistakes. Uh, once again, uh, this is a live class uh, with our HVAC apprentices. Uh, from Lake Technical College, uh, registered apprenticeship program, program here in the state of Florida and the city of beautiful Eustis and uh, historic Eustis, Florida, named after General Eustis, actually, which regrettably uh, is one of the things he's best known for is burning down a, uh, a, a Native American uh, Seminole Indian uh, encampment very close to where I'm sitting right now, uh, strangely enough. So uh, it all comes full circle. I'm not sure what comes full circle, but something. Anyway, so thanks for joining. Here we go. First things first. So let's talk through, because um, again, you know, we could we could just jump straight into, all right, you know, you add refrigerant in order to get your sub cooling up and that's it. Um, but I want to talk through kind of what charge really even does and how to think about charge differently than you probably have in the past. That's going to help you make sense of maybe more complicated problems. So first off, what's the goal of the refrigeration circuit? What are we trying to do in the refrigeration circuit? You know, air conditioning is simultaneous control of, you know, airflow, humidity, temperature, uh, noise, filtration, all those things. We can add in a few more that even Willis Carrier probably didn't think about initially. Um, that's air conditioning, but the refrigeration circuit has a very specific goal. And its specific goal is to move heat around. Now, a lot of people focus on the latent phase change, the change from a liquid to a vapor or a vapor to a liquid. And they like to focus on that as what causes, you know, what really the refrigeration circuit is, but it isn't necessarily. In fact, and, and I've mentioned this before in other live streams and videos and podcasts, that some of the first refrigeration circuits were actually single phase, meaning that all they did was compress and decompress vapor, usually air. And then they started figuring out, hey, we can leverage this latent phase change in order to move a lot more heat around. So uh, it's kind of a kind of a cool thing uh, that we can do by changing from liquid to vapor, vapor to liquid. And uh, you've probably seen the charts before. I won't bore you with it, but you move a lot more BTUs when you're phase changing. But regardless, the goal is to get heat moved from one place to another. So to absorb it and then reject it. And we're absorbing heat into the evaporator coil. That's where we're picking it up at. And then we're rejecting it in the condenser. So that's the goal. Refrigerant is the medium by which we do that, um, but it's not uh, its not the whole story. And a lot of times the adding and removal of refrigerant is what technicians rely on because it's sort of the, the thing you can do. It's the easy dial you can turn uh, on the equipment in order to make a change in it, but uh, it's really uh, often overused and often not really the problem. 
And so it becomes something that uh, causes more problems than it solves when techs start either removing refrigerant or adding refrigerant, generally adding. You know, it seems to be that the answer is add a little Freon to, to almost everything. And at least that's the customer's perspective. So let's talk about that a little bit. What does having more or less refrigerant do to the system? So I want one of the, I want one of the students to pipe up. So I'm, I'm going to give you a second to get prepared on your mute button there. So what happens to the system? And there's no right or wrong answers here. Okay, there are right or wrong answers, but I'm not going to say, I'm not going to yell wrong at you if you say them wrong. What happens to the system if it has too little refrigerant in it? What happens to the system? Somebody want to take that one or do I need to call on you? Uh, start freezing up. So it could freeze up, right? And actually that's the, uh, that's the slide that I have here. The image that I have here is in our nine panel on diagnosing a freezing of apertic oil. And I did that for a reason because this focuses on all the other things that can cause freezing. But potentially it could cause the system to freeze up, sure. Uh, but why is that? Why does having less refrigerant, why can that result in the system freezing up, specifically the evaporative oil freezing up? Uh, because you're not boiling it off in the evaporator. Uh, oh, yeah. oh, yeah. As it goes through the coil, it's boiling off too quickly. Okay, boiling off too quickly. Yeah, that's true. Uh, but why does that result in freezing? Liquid yeah, refrigerant's cold. <laughs> okay, so it boils at a low temperature, All right? So, but why is it boiling? So, so we kind of nailed it down here. We're chasing down the answer. It's boiling at too low of a temperature, right? And the reason it's boiling at too low of a temperature when you have an undercharged condition is because you don't have enough stuff. You don't have enough molecules, right? So when you don't have uh -huh. enough stuff, you don't have enough molecules that are changing, then what tends to happen is it doesn't exert enough force inside the evaporator coil in order to keep that pressure up and control that boiling temperature where we want it to be. But in terms of a freezing evaporator coil, that's actually not the first place you, that's not the first thing you do, right? That can result, low refrigerant can result in a frozen evaporator coil. I actually got in an argument with someone about this who said it can never cause a frozen evaporator coil. And that is uh, most certainly not true. Again, we're talking about air conditioning here. Um, you know, if you, a lot of people will say, you know, like well, if they're working in refrigeration, they'll be like, that coil's freezing up. It's like, well, if it's a, if it's a freezer, then that coil better freeze up. Um, otherwise it's not going to, uh, <laughs> it's not going to cool the thing that it's attempting to cool. But in air conditioning, we, it's undesirable for an evaporator coil to freeze up. And so not having enough stuff in the evaporator coil can result in not having enough pressure because higher pressure equals, remember we harped on this in class, higher temperature, right? Higher pressure equals higher temperature, lower pressure equals lower temperature, right? And so when you have uh, the pressure in your evaporator coil is too low, that results in a lower temperature evaporator coil. But there's another little trick there. We're going to, we're going to get to that. So what, what happens in the entire system? So not just the evaporator coil, what happens in the entire system? What are some other things that happens when you don't have enough refrigerant in it? Uh, well, some majority of the compressors are refrigerant cooled. So your compressor is going to run warm. It's going to run hot. Yep. That's a good one. Hey, Corey, why don't you unmute? What are some things that happen in the system when you have uh, too little refrigerant in it? You have no liquid or not enough liquid in your condenser. Okay, not enough liquid in your condenser. And what's the result? What's the negative result of not having enough liquid in your condenser? Low sub, low sub. Low sub cool. And low sub cool means what? What does low sub cool mean? Uh, less liquid getting to the evaporator. Sure. It means that you're not, you don't, uh, you could potentially actually not have a full line of liquid when it uh, gets to your metering device. So, when that refrigerant gets there, you could actually already have refrigerant that's boiled off already, and now that's lost capacity, right? So there's lots of things that happen in the system when you have low refrigerant. What happens if you have too much refrigerant? What does that do to the system? You just throw some things out there. High head pressure. Okay, and why do you have high head pressure? Because you have a, oh, you have too much liquid in your system. Too much liquid specifically in one component. You overfeed the compressor? Yeah, in your condenser. Yeah, so specifically you get high head pressure because 
you have too much refrigerant in your condenser. And so what that does is, and we'll talk about this a little later, I'm, I'm, we're doing this exercise because I want you to get your minds primed. So it's not just me talking, is that in your condenser, those bottom, that bottom row or bottom couple rows are full of liquid. When you add more refrigerant, that liquid starts stacking up inside that condenser. By itself, that's not an issue until you actually get to the place where you have hydrostatic pressure, and that's a serious problem. But as you're stacking liquid in there, what does that do to the effective area of the condenser that's actually dedicated to condensing? Uh, causes your blue side to go up. Causes your blue side to go up. Oh, geez. We're not going to have blue and red <laughs> side here. Inside joke, people. Um, what uh, happens? You... Go ahead, Corey. Oh, go ahead. No, you go. Um, I totally forgot what Oh, um, yeah, you're not, you're not um, giving that enough time to the liquid enough time. You're basically just have a full condenser full of liquid. So. Correct. Correct. And when you fill a condenser full of liquid, what happens is, is you decrease the amount of space that condensing can occur. And when that happens, that refrigerant is still going to condense, but it's going to happen at a higher temperature and a higher pressure. So, you know, I try not to talk too much about in terms of like suction pressure and head pressure, or liquid pressure, because really what we care about in the case of the condenser is the condensing temperature, right? When the condensing temperature goes up, because now there's less space, that also impacts your compression ratio. Compression ratio is absolute head pressure divided by absolute suction pressure. When that happens, your compressor doesn't perform as well. So it doesn't actually move as much refrigerant. And that results in uh, lower efficiency. Obviously, your current is going to go up when you have higher head pressure, and you're going to move less refrigerant. Your mass flow rate is going to go down. So it's just a lose-lose all the way around to have unnecessarily high head pressure. We never want unnecessarily high head pressure. We want to keep it as low as we can stand to keep it. So having too much refrigerant in the system is no bueno. Refrigerant is just the medium by which we're moving the heat around. It's actually the heat going in and out of the refrigerant at the proper rates that controls and modulates our suction pressure and our head pressure, i.e. our evaporator temperature and our condensing temperature. Because we want our evaporator temperature and our condensing temperature to be in certain ranges. We talk about subcool, superheat, all this. But really what we're saying is we want enough refrigerant in that system to fill up that bottom row or two of the condenser based on the design with liquid, to have our liquid line full of liquid, and then to have enough refrigerant boiling in our evaporator coil so that we're filling most of that evaporator coil with boiling refrigerant. Anything else, any additional, in addition to that, actually results in less efficiency. It actually makes the system run worse. So we don't, having a little extra isn't helpful. Now, a couple of guys here, both Chad and Corey, working market refrigeration, grocery refrigeration. When you have a receiver, that receiver holds that additional liquid. And so that kind of acts as your buffer tank. You know, it kind of allows you to operate uh, with a proper charge over a wider range of overall system uh, charge weight. As long as it's but, below 80%. What's that? You don't want to have it above 80%. No, you never want to have your receiver above, above 80%. And, and really from a design consideration, you want to be able to pump down your entire system. Your entire system charge should fit into that receiver without it being more than 80% full. Um, now that's not always the case, but that's uh, the way that they uh, should be designed. So the also, point being, think, go ahead. Sorry, um, uh, uh, when you put your hand over a condenser fan motor and it's not rejecting the heat, you know, it's just cool or, you know, ambient air temp. Uh, that's, that's overcharged though, right? Or that be undercharged? No, that would, it, it could be a lot of different things. Um, but what that means is, is that you have a low condensing temperature. So um, that, and that in and of itself isn't the problem, but what it often means is that you don't, you, you don't, you're not rejecting much heat, uh, meaning you're not absorbing much heat. So if you're not feeling much heat coming off your condenser fan, that's all the heat from whatever you're pulling it out of. So that means you're not picking up much heat. And that can be a, a myriad of different things. It could be undercharged, could be a poor compression, um, could be a lot of things. Uh, you know, it could be that all the fans are off, you know, on the evaporator side. And so you're just not absorbing much heat that way. But that's when you, whenever you don't feel much heat rejection on the outside, less than would be normal. Um, that's what that is. On the flip side, if you feel very hot air coming out of the top of the condenser, that means that you have a higher condensing temperature, i.e. higher head pressure. So when you're, 
discharge air out of your condenser feels hotter than normal. And again, we're talking completely um, subjective here. But you know, if you throw your hand up, uh, over enough condensers, you start to get a pretty good sense of what's normal and what's not. Um, that's that's what that would indicate would be um, high head pressure. And so all the things that cause high head pressure would cause high condenser discharge air temperature. Cool. I like how I like how you all are engaging. It's good stuff. Mario, you just unmuted. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> no, I thought you wanted to say something. That's all. Well, I, all right. I did earlier. I guess I didn't mute it again. Okay. Well, feel free to butt in anytime. <laughs> all right. So those are just a few things I wanted to cover. Um, so everything's all connected, but let's talk about things you need to know before ever adjusting the charge. You need to know or do. You always do these before you mess with charge. And I don't care what kind of unit you're working on. Um, it, it, you know, these things aren't going to necessarily all be exactly the same, but the categories that they represent are going to be the same. Always check everything that has to do with evaporator and condenser airflow before you start messing with charge. Now, when I say everything, obviously you're not going to uh, do, do a full duct inspection every time, uh, probably, but you need to at least do these visual things because it's going to save you so much heartache. So uh, look at your air filters, look at your evaporator coil condition. Uh, look at your blower wheel and your condenser cleanliness. Pay attention to other obvious things. Like, does it look like somebody put a, a different motor in here, a non-factory motor? Does it look like maybe somebody put a new fan blade in on the condenser and maybe put it in a different position in the shroud than it was supposed to be? Maybe somebody put in a uh, condenser fan that's a, a different motor than it was originally designed for. So always do a solid visual inspection. For those, those of you guys who work in market refrigeration, that would be an example would be where you use the vein anemometer and you go through and you make sure that all your cases have proper air velocity coming out of them. Um, but you don't want to go adjusting valves or making changes to charge or anything like that until you have ensured to the best of your ability, to the best practical, that you have proper system cleanliness and that you have proper airflow. Now, when we say measure airflow, that's largely a misnomer. So for example, when you use that vein anemometer and you go through and you are testing the air coming out of those cases, you're not measuring airflow in terms of CFM. You're measuring velocity only. But it's enough to compare one case to the other and see, you know, you're kind of doing one of these things is not like the other. You go from case to case and all of a sudden you hit one that doesn't have nearly the same velocity. Now you're going to investigate and see what's causing that airflow problem. But that's the point. You want to make sure just from a practical standpoint, you're always doing your visual inspections first before you start messing with um, adding or removing refrigerant. You need to know what type of metering device you have. Uh, does anybody know why you need to know what type of metering device you have before you start adding refrigerant to a system? Because if you have a uh, fixed metering device, you're going to be that's going to determine what you're going to be charging by. So you, if you have a piston, for example, superheat expansion valve that's a constant superheat device so you'd be looking more at your stuff. correct yeah so you're going to um you're going to charge based on the type of metering device you have the the uh, the method you're going to use now even that's not always the case I mean, for example, uh, ductless systems, you know, they're going to have electronic expansion valves in them, but the manufacturers are generally not even going to give you guidelines of how to charge based on measurements. They're going to tell you weigh the charge out and weigh it back in. So the right answer is that we charge based on the way the manufacturer tells us. But for the majority of the uh, air conditioning equipment that we work on, that rule holds true. If you have a TXV, you charge by subcooling. If you have a fixed metering device, um, something like a piston or maybe even the, you know, the kind of the header crimp metering devices that we see on some of these uh, rooftop units. In that case, you're going to charge by superheat. But what that doesn't mean is that you only check subcooling on a TXV and you only check superheat on a piston system. Does anybody know why that is? Why, why is that a misnomer? Why don't we only check subcooling on TXV systems? Why do we also check superheat? Anybody know? Because your superheat's still gonna, well, there's a lot of different reasons, but um, you know, if you have an expansion valve, you're still gonna wanna make sure that that expansion valve, you know, that the power head doing its job and you don't have too high a superheat, too low a superheat. Same thing with airflow. If you have a lot, if you, have, if you don't have enough airflow across that coil, obviously that's gonna throw off a bunch of your reading. 
um, if you don't have a full pump, liquid going that expansion valve, that's off, and it's only going to meter properly with a uh, liquid. With the, yeah, exactly. You broke up there a little bit at the end, but yeah, you, you have to look at more than just charging because again, like we're saying, we like to adjust things based on adjusting charge, but often the problem with the system isn't charge. So we're chat, we're measuring superheat and subcooling and watching both of them because we're not just looking at getting our charge right. We're looking at is the entire system working properly and superheat and subcool together tell us the full story. And we're going to talk more about what that full story is as we move forward. But very simply, superheat tells us about evaporator filling and subcooling tells us about condenser filling. Now, some of you, that may be the first time you've ever heard that, but I want to say it again. And I want you to think about it, especially those of you who are a little more experienced and tell me if I'm wrong. Superheat is about evaporator filling. And subcooling is about condenser filling. We'll, we'll, we'll cover that more as we go forward, but just think on that one. All right. So we, got, we have to know what type of metering device we have. We have to know what type of blower technology we have. Now, why on earth, before we charge a system, would we need to know what type of blower technology we have? Anybody want to take a stab at that one? Why would we even care what type of blower we have in place? The reason we care, I, I, I figured nobody would want to take that one. The reason we well, care, is it, are you talking about the motor or the, the actual blower itself? No, not, not the wheel, but the, yeah, the type of motor. Yes, the type of motor. Why, why, why do we care what type of motor we have in place before we start um, adding charge to a system? I mean, you got variable speed, single speed. Um, you know, is it going to ramp up higher when, you know, it's really trying to cool down or, you know, once it's close to within a degree or two of, you know, what you have it set to? it's going to slow, it could slow down that blower. And that's when you, your numbers are going to get thrown off a little bit. Yeah. So a couple things here, one is, and some, somebody is saying that in the comments too, is that we need to make sure that we're at full airflow and full system capacity for charging purposes. That's one, but also if you have a variable speed setup, and again, we're talking about air conditioning here, mostly if you have a variable speed motor setup, there's a very good likelihood that it was not set up properly to begin with. Meaning that, you know, if it's an X13, it might not be tapped properly. If it's an ECM, it's possible that it's set for the wrong tonnage, or maybe you're not getting a G call, which can cause it to ramp down. There's a lot of things that people do wrong when they set up uh, variable speed motors, even, you know, the dehumidification. If that's not set up properly, the thing could be running a dehumidification mode all the time. We want to make sure that before we adjust charge, that we're at full blower speed. Obviously, if it's a multi-stage compressor, variable speed compressor or whatever, we also want to make sure that's at high stage. But we need to know, and I probably should have added that here, you know, what, is it a single stage system or not? Um, but we need to know what type of system we've got. We need to know what type of blower we have, because if we do have those more advanced technologies, there's a very good chance that the issue that we're seeing is due to that being set up improperly. So you've got to start there. All right, next, you need to know your return uh, indoor air temperature. Now, if you're going to set the charge by superheat, you need to also know your wet bulb temperature in order to, you know, charge a piston or a uh, TXV system. Um, but at minimum, you need to know the actual return indoor air temperature. And that's just something you, you got to know anyway. I, I say indoor air temperature slash return. It's really great if you know both. It's great if you know what the thermostat's saying and then also what it is in the return. And that's handy uh, because it can all tell you a little something about duct leakage or return leakage. If you're drawn in air from your attic, for example, um, then your air temperature by your unit is going to be higher than it is at the thermostat. So it's nice if you can kind of pay attention to both of those. Now, again, when you have a, a, a thermostat and then a, a, you know, a, a probe thermometer, they're not necessarily always going to read the same thing. Um, so you got to take into account for you know, differences in calibration, obviously. And then you also have to know your outdoor temperature. And I specify in the shade. You got to know what your outdoor temperature is in the shade. Um, so these are things you always know before you, before you start messing with charge. Don't mess with charge until you know these things, until you check these things, until you've resolved these issues. And that alone, I could stop here. And you would, if you follow this, uh, you'd be a better technician. Because most of the issues that occur with charging problems is you know people overcharging a system or maybe dumping charge out because they have high head pressure and they're not paying attention to other things it can be resolved by just very thorough um, inspection and then taking some basic measurements having what you need
The next thing though, is weighing in on line length. I want to talk about that quickly because it's important that if you are charging a system to begin with, I don't want you just focusing on superheat and subcool. I want you to also have paid attention to at least an estimation of line length and looked at the manufacturer's um, information as far as what the original factory charge was. And then that's going to give you a sense of as you're adding or removing charge, you're going to get a much better idea. Again, of course, using a scale, that's the biggest thing. If you're ever recovering or charging, you need to always have a scale under that tank. Um, and look, I'm the chief of sinners. When I first started off in the trade, nobody was using scales under their tanks and it was all a guess, guessing game, but that's not a good business plan. Uh, it, it can be unethical. Uh, and also you're going to run into more trouble because if you got a system, for example, where the total factory charge is, you know, six pounds, we'll say six pounds of 410A and your line length is, you know, maybe 40 feet or something like that. And then you look at the manufacturer, uh, you know, chart and you say, okay, that's going to you know, end up with a few more ounces of charge. And now you start adding in a pound, two pounds, and you're not seeing a significant change. You really need to stop because as a percentage, you've already added, uh, you know, like 30% of the total system charge. And that's, you should have seen more change than that. And that's where uh, using a scale helps you do that. This is where it, it kind of prevents the tech from, you know, jacking eight, 10, 15 pounds in a system before they find out, oops, it's an airflow problem, right? So paying attention to that line length, uh, if you are going to charge a system, you're going to commission it initially, weigh it in appropriately, you know, look at your line length, Look at the manufacturer's guidelines, weigh that in, and then look at your superheat, subcool, and all your other measurements. So that's that's big. All right. Next thing. Um, I like the term fixed versus dynamic metering device. A dynamic metering device uh, would be your TXV, TEV, EXV, um, whatever you want to call them. I mean, everybody gets worked up about, you know, if you call them the wrong thing, but uh, in the case of a dynamic metering device, there's something that moves inside of it. And that's all dynamic means. It just means that it moves. And so with a dynamic metering device, that's where we're going to primarily use subcooling as our charging factor. And with a fixed metering device, that's where we're going to primarily use superheat as our charging factor. The most common fixed metering devices that we're going to see are pistons. Um, some of the brands called it an accurator for a while. I think it might be a carrier term capillary tubes and smaller pieces of equipment, you know, small self-contained uh, fridges, that sort of thing. And then on package units, sometimes you'll see the header crimp and the header crimp is just simply, um, and I, I don't, I think there's actually a technical name for that. And I, I don't remember, I never remember what it is, but um, where you're going to see a liquid line and it looks like it just goes straight from the liquid line right into the evaporator coil. Well, you know, that can't be the case. There has to be a pressure drop in order for there to be boiling in the evaporator coil. And so if you pay attention, you'll often see these little spots and that's where um, it's metered and it's in multiple places. Um, I know Corey, you've had some, uh, you've had, you've seen some systems with issues with those header crimps before, right? Yeah, all the time. Um, but the header crimp ones, to my understanding, are called accurators. Oh, they're called. But I could be wrong, but that's what I've always called them. Okay. Yeah. I, I know there was at least one manufacturer who called a piston an accurator. Um, this goes all the way back to like mid nineties, hmm. something like that. But, um, but yeah, that's, that, that is possible. Um, but either way, it's, it's just a, it's just a pressure drop. Um, and, and the problem that they have generally, my understanding is that they get uh, plugged up with wax. Um, right. That's what, that's the, that's the issue with them. Yep. Yeah. They, um, yeah. Especially with, when you run, high head pressure, you know, dirty condenser coils and stuff like that. It'll um, like kind of cook that oil and clog. And yep. they actually sell a, uh, a conversion kit to co convert all that into a, an expansion valve. Yep. Yep. So good thing to know if you ever see those, um, I should have put a picture here of those, uh, but it's something to watch out for. Uh, so I want to talk quickly. Why do you think, why don't we charge a TXV, TEV, e EXV, why don't we charge those by superheat? What's the reason we use superheat on a fixed metering device and we use subcooling when we're doing a TXV TEV? Go ahead, any of you, take a stab at it. Why? What's the reason? I'm waiting. I'm just going to wait. Anybody? <laughs> Go ahead, uh, Chad, Corey. Um, I Go ahead, Chad. 
Hey, sorry. Can you, uh, can you just repeat that? My bad. No, it's okay. <laughs> Why do we use... Ow. Ouch. Why don't we use superheat when we're charging... Uh, as the as the primary charging factor when we're charging a TXV TEV electronic expansion valve. Oh, because uh, uh, it's okay. You can take a pass. You got a screaming kid. Go ahead, Corey. You can take it. Um. So the expansion valve is going to open and close based on the load. Well, suction line temperature in particular. Um, so depending on how hot it is uh, and the space that you're trying to cool, you know, that thing's going to be wide open. It's going to, it's basically going to meter. It's going to try to maintain a, uh, the superheat that that needs as far as a fixed metering device or orifice. Um, you're going to have to provide that flow through. So you need a you know, the proper charge to go through that metering device for it to um, get the superheat. So basically the expansion valve is going to do the superheat for you, provided you have the correct amount of charge going to it. So yeah, it'll, full, it'll fluctuate. Yeah. Full line of liquid. So with it, with that's, a TX, that's exactly what I was going to say. That, that's exactly what you were going to say. Yeah. And then your kid's screaming in your ear and it just distracts you. I get it. I've been there. You know, I got 10 of them. They're all, they're all just outside. I lock them all outside and make them play with the ferret now. Um, get a ferret. That's a tip that I have uh, if you have screaming kids, uh, especially a bitey ferret, but then it makes them scream more, but for diff more different reasons. Anyway, so all you got to do in order to make that uh, that TXV do its job, when I say all you've got to do, it's not all, but it's the main factor, is feed it with a full line of liquid. And we see this in this image here. I'm going to go ahead and get my pointer out so you can see what I'm pointing at here. Oops, there we go. So all you got to do to make the valve work properly is to feed it with a full line of liquid. And then it uses a balance between your bulb that feeds to the power head, which is your P1 force, and your external equalizer. And then it balances based on superheat. So another name for a TXV, one that I prefer, is a constant superheat valve. The reason why you can't charge a system, so to answer the question, the reason why you can't charge a TXV system by superheat is because that's the valve's job. The valve's job is to set superheat. So we just need to make sure we feed it proper liquid. And subcooling is basically a measurement that tells us whether or not we're feeding it a full line of liquid. Even one degree of subcooling is a full line of liquid, but it's kind of, you know, it's on the edge, right? So we give it more so that way it doesn't begin to flash by the time it makes it from the outlet of the condenser where we set the subcooling to where it gets to the valve. Now, if you work in a, a you know, refrigeration, you know that subcooling isn't really what they use. They use a clear sight glass and then they have a receiver and the receiver holds the excess liquid. So either way, you know, we, we, we can get obsessed with subcooling as if subcooling in, in and of itself is the, is the main thing. The main thing is feeding the valve with a full line of liquid. Now, if that liquid temperature can be lower, that improves the efficiency of the evaporator coil. So we can do more with that evaporator coil if uh, it's it's a lower temperature um, uh, liquid going into it, but uh, but that's actually a little more complicated than than a lot of people realize. Um, really, what we're trying to do is just make sure that we have a full line of liquid feeding it. So when we have a fixed metering device, we have to set the charge based on superheat because as we adjust the charge, we're going to be adjusting our head pressure, increasing and decreasing our head pressure. And when you have higher pressure going into a fixed metering device guess what happens to the pressure going out? Higher pressure in equals higher pressure out. I was hoping somebody would pipe up, but I didn't give you enough time. Higher pressure into a fixed metering device equals higher pressure out of a fixed metering device. And we need to make sure that we don't overfeed that evaporator coil because we don't want to run suction. We don't want to run liquid down the suction line into the compressor. We will kill that compressor if we feed it with liquid. And so we got to prevent that from happening. And so we've got to get that superheat range set in properly. Also, we don't want the superheat to be too high. If the superheat's too high, then our evaporator coil isn't being fully fed. So that's inefficient. And also our compressor is going to run hot because the compressor relies on the suction gas. So that's the issue with a fixed metering device. It's good because of its simplicity, but it's challenging because it, depending on various load conditions, it could either be overfeeding or underfeeding the evaporator coil. And so we have to kind of set it in uh, in kind of a happy medium so that way we don't run into those problems. 
but it's less than I just want to, its efficiency. I want to jump in real quick and sure. just say also that uh, it's very important that when you are charging a system that you don't you 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 want to make sure you have you know your proper outdoor it's like you don't want it to be charging when it's pouring down rain or if it's okay. like, you know super super cold outside right yeah. yep that's another good point so on air conditioning the general rule and this varies a little bit but what what different manufacturers will tell you but the general rule is when you're charging and cooling and air conditioning you don't want to charge when it's below 65 degrees outside it kind of gets you outside of the scale out of the normal operating conditions so remember these systems are designed their normal operating conditions as far as how they were rated is 95 degree outdoor temperature, 80 degree uh, indoor temperature, 80 degree return temperature. So as far as the manufacturers are concerned for efficiency ratings, that is the operating temperature. But you know, more realistically, you're going to be anywhere from like you know 85 to 95 uh, outside, and then anywhere from you know 70 to 80 inside. That's sort of your normal operating conditions. Um, when you start getting outside of that, then uh, the system isn't really operating uh, as designed. But again, 65 degree outdoor temperature, and you make a really good point on rain. When it's raining outside, what's happening uh, to the system? What happens to the system when it rains? Anybody know? We well, are cooling that outdoor. It's cooling that condenser off. It's cooling the condenser off, which results in what? Uh, probably... Lower Would it be a higher? Uh, say that, Corey. Lower saturation temperature. Yeah, so you're going to have a lower condensing temperature, and you're going to have lower head pressure. And when you decrease your head pressure, you're also going to tend to decrease your suction pressure too. So you potentially could get outside of the, the proper operation range and run uh, lower suction pressure too. Now, obviously, big systems like rack refrigeration, they account for all of that. Um, but it is going, that system is going to be operating in a condition that it wasn't designed for. Now, it's actually generally going to be operating more efficiently than it's designed for because when you have a wet condenser coil, you have this evaporative cooling. The fancy term for that is adiabatic cooling. Um, and that results in lower condensing temperature and therefore lower compression ratio. Lower compression ratio means the compressor moves more refrigerant. And so you actually get higher capacity out of the system. If you ever want to do this just for fun, I, I've done it in the past, uh, you hook up your psychrometers on the system, hook up measure quick so that you can actually pay attention to your BTUs that the system's producing, then go outside and wet your condenser with a hose and you'll watch your total system capacity uh, rises. The actual total amount of cooling that the system produces rises. And that's a that's kind of an old school trick. They use it in grocery all the time. If you've got a really, really hot day or you've got you know, an issue with a, with a condenser that's starting to deteriorate, or even if you lose a fan, sometimes they'll run sprinklers on the condenser in order to get more efficiency out of it or to get by. And it's actually not a terrible idea if you're just doing it temporarily. You just don't want to do it for an extended period of time because it's going to rot out whatever that water's running on um, over time. But I'll tell people that if you're trying to get, you know, a customer by um, for a couple of days on like the hottest, you know, say you have it on seasonably hot weather, Nothing wrong with, with having people run a sprinkler on it for a couple of days. It's not going to hurt anything unless they have like ridiculously high chlorine levels. Um, and so the, I, you know, I actually wrote a newsletter at one point uh, when the temperatures were going to be over 100 degrees. And I said, look, you know, if you want to get more out of your air conditioner, just put it on mist and run it, uh, run it next to your condenser and let it, you know, let it suck in that, that water. Um, probably the uh, St. John's Water Management District probably doesn't appreciate that much and uh, in some places, that would be complete heresy, but it does help with the system. Um, does help with the system efficiency, the amount of uh, efficiency and capacity. All right, so that was a little bit of an aside, but a good thing for everybody to know. Superheat and subcooling. Why do we use different charging methods for each metering device type? Well, we already talked about that. All right, so let's talk about some acceptable ranges because um, there, there's going to be some variation depending on the system, depending on the technology, depending on the category. But the, there's some pretty standard acceptable ranges where when you're outside of these acceptable ranges, you know it's pretty much a problem. So let's talk about that. What is the acceptable range of superheat? What is the acceptable range? So what, let's start here. What is the lowest superheat that you should measure. Now, again, we're not talking about a flooded system or anything like that. We're talking about a typical air conditioning or refrigeration system. What's the lowest superheat that you should measure? Uh, well, one, residential. Anyway. Go ahead. Or point one. 
point one. Okay, that's uh, so that's true, right? You don't want to get down to zero. Zero means you're flooding back. Um, but that's that's actually outside of the acceptable range, just because our thermometers aren't even that accurate. And there's this well, other thing. Go ahead. Refrigeration, you know, like our like our freezers and walk-ins, you know, we we have those like three to five, but right. I feel like residential, I think like what sixteen, eighteen superheat is acceptable. So it is gonna be it is gonna be higher in residential, and often it's because of where we're measuring. So in refrigeration, when you're setting the superheat on a case, where are you measuring the superheat? At the case. At the case, right? So right at the outlet of that evaporator coil. If you measure the superheat right before it goes into the compressor. Have you, have you done that before and seen what it is? I have not, actually. Oh, that's a thing to do, especially if you have a compressor that's failing. Like Go ahead. What was it? What did you say, yeah, Corey? Like 30. I said be around like 30, 40. Yeah, it'll be high. It'll be, it, it'll be high. And this is in grocery specifically. Um, and so that means that even if you set your superheat at five, say, at the outlet of a case, by the time it makes it up all the way back to the rack, it could be significantly higher. And in residential we measure our superheat outside all the time, right? We're not measuring it right at the outlet of the coil. We're measuring it outside. And so that's why we're commonly going to see, you know, 15, 16, 17, 18 in that range. We're going to see that quite often. If you measured it at the outlet of the evaporator coil, it would probably be more like 10, 12, 13 on average. So that's, that's pretty typical for air conditioning. In refrigeration, where you're trying to get the most you can out of that coil and your risk of flood back is a lot less, um, I shouldn't say that it's not a lot less. It's, it's, it's actually worse for different reasons, but you have to have about a five degree sub superheat minimum for most valves, especially TXVs, because there's something called a minimum stable superheat, which means that you get to a point with that valve. If you adjust it any more than that, where it's feeding more, it can potentially lose control and overfeed. So there's just this point where if you try to get a little closer than that, it'll just lose control and overfeed. Um, and so for a lot of valves, minimum stable superheat is, is, you know, five, six in that range for TXVs. Electronic expansion valves can get a little tighter than that because obviously they're using electronics rather than, uh, you know, old school, um, you know, hydraulic forces. So uh, with electronic expansion valves, you can get down to three, you know, three, four more consistently. And that, that alone can make a significant uh, capacity difference, especially in a really critical environment like grocery or industrial. Industrial. So your typical ranges, um, depending, you know, regardless of the valve you're using, re regardless of what you're working on, it's going to be somewhere between three to four at the lowest. Your superheat's going to be, and then if you're measuring it back at the compressor, your highest superheats are going to be thirty-ish, sometimes more than that, you know, in, in certain applications. But you know, for typical units, that's going to be about um, your standard. And the reason is is that uh, Copeland and a lot of manufacturers uh, will publish that, and, and this is an air conditioning uh, number, but they don't want return gas. They don't want suction gas coming back to the compressor with a temperature that's higher than 65 degrees Fahrenheit. And you, anybody know why that is? Why don't we want our return gas going to our compressor being more than 65 degrees Fahrenheit? Won't cool the compressor. Won't cool the compressor. Very simple, right? So if you're checking suction line temperature, you can actually tell a lot about how a system's running just by checking suction line temperature if you've already done all the other stuff that we talked about. Vapor coil, air filter, indoor temperature, all that sort of thing, right? Because if the system is operating in under normal operating conditions, what, what's a normal temperature, a normal average temperature that people keep it inside with their air conditioning? 72, 75. I'll say 75 is the average, right? But if you have that number, so you know if it's 72 or 75 or 80, you know what it is. Now you can kind of anchor what your expected suction line temperature is. It's actually a pretty, pretty cool thing to do. And so if you're running a system and it's 75 degrees inside and you go outside and check your suction line temperature and it's 70, right off the bat, you know there's a problem. Now that doesn't mean that it's charge. It could be a restriction. It could be a metering device that's not feeding properly. It could be charge. could be that it's undercharged. But what that's telling you is, is that your suction gas going back to that compressor is warm enough that given enough time, it's going to result in damage to that compressor. Now, that doesn't mean it's going to explode instantaneously. A lot of people think when I say it's going to damage the compressor, that means instantaneous failure. No, that's rarely the case. It just means over time, the oil is going to break down, loss of lubrication, that compressor is going to fail. So we don't want to run, at least in air conditioning, we don't want to run return gas temperatures over 65. 
which means that if you think of the average evaporative coil temperature, this may be beyond some of you, but I want you to think about this. What is a typical evaporator coil temperature that we run or run in air conditioning? 40 degrees. 40 degrees, right? 40. So if your standard indoor temperature is 75 and your standard uh, TD design temperature difference is 35 degrees, meaning that you have 35 degree lower evaporator temperature than inside, then that means a standard evaporator coil temperature, if it's if they have it 75 degrees inside, is gonna be about 40 degrees, right? So if 65 degrees is the maximum that that suction gas should be, what is our maximum superheat that we should have at our compressor with a 40 degree coil? 65 is the maximum number. 40 degree coil, superheat is a uh, temperature that's 25. added beyond boiling, beyond that evaporator temperature. So what's the maximum superheat we should have? 25. 25, you got 25. it. I was waiting for somebody to do it. I wasn't, yeah. gonna, I wasn't gonna bail you out there. So 25 degrees is pretty much your maximum superheat if you have a 40 degree evaporator coil. Now, obviously, uh, if the conditions are different, then that may vary. Um, but that's, you know, kind of a, kind of your, your average maximum. You wouldn't want to get below five because five degrees is super heat, because that means you've lost control potentially of your valve and you could flood back. You could, uh, run liquid down into your compressor. Compressor is not a liquid pump. And so that could damage it. So suction gas too hot equals compressor damage. Suction gas, zero superheat equals compressor damage. So we got to keep it in that range, right? Subcooling. What's our acceptable range of subcooling? Uh, well, it depends on the, on the manufacturer. Depends on the system, right? It does depend on the system. Yeah. But if we think of what you're typically going to see in like refrigeration, subcooling is going to be low because you're using your receiver as your liquid storage tank, right? And you don't even really generally measure it. You just make sure you have a full line of liquid. You're using a side glass generally. And so there, it doesn't really matter. But you know, for most systems under most conditions, even a piston, you're going to have somewhere between five degrees of subcooling and maybe in the high end 20, you know, like it's going to be in there. There's going to be very rare circumstances you're going to see outside of that range in most of the equipment we work on. Now, obviously, in order to know what the subcooling should be, you got to look at the manufacturer data plate or their information. But so now you've kind of got something to go on on both of these. You got somewhere to, you know, you kind of have a good sense of where you're supposed to be. Even if you don't know much about the equipment, you know that you shouldn't have a zero subcool. You know, you shouldn't have a zero superheat. You know, 30 degrees of superheat is probably too high. You know, 30 degrees of subcool is probably too high for this piece of equipment. So it gives you something to go off of. All right. We talked about this before, but when you have a superheat that is too low, that means that you are overfeeding your evaporator coil. Okay, superheat that is too low means you're feeding liquid too far. So superheat is an indication of how well you are feeding your evaporator coil with refrigerant. I want you to think about that. Superheat is telling you how well you're feeding your evaporator coil with refrigerant. If you've got a low superheat, it means too low. That means that you're feeding it too much. If you got a superheat that's too high, it means you're feeding it too little. But that doesn't mean that it's charge that's doing it, right? You could have a bunch of refrigerant that's backed up in the condenser and you have a liquid line filter dryer that's restricted. And so it's not letting enough refrigerant to make, make it into that evaporator coil, which could result in high superheat. You could have a, uh, a TXG that has a failed power head or has a, a screen that's plugged um, that's also causing that evaporator coil to underfeed, which would result in high superheat. So it's not always charge, but it could be, right? If you're charging a system by superheat and you've already gone through everything else and you're saying, okay, it is charge. Well, then you add more charge in order to decrease the superheat in order to feed more cold liquid through that evaporator coil, more boiling refrigerant through that evaporator coil. Whatever, term, whatever word you want to use, more saturated refrigerant through the evaporator coil. A lot of people don't like to think of it as boiling, because that confuses them, even though that really is what it is. In the evaporator coil, we have boiling refrigerant that boils at a low temperature. So superheat tells us how well we're feeding that evaporator coil. Subcooling tells us how much liquid we're stacking in the condenser. Now, 
if you have a this is assuming you don't have a mechanical subcooler because last time I talked about this stacking of of uh, liquid refrigerant, somebody's like, well, if you have a mechanical subcooler, that's not how that works. Okay, most systems that most of us work on don't have mechanical subcoolers. If you do, then actually the mechanical subcooler is cooling the liquid. Um, but in most cases, when we see ten degrees of subcool, that tells us that we're stacking the right amount. If that system was rated for ten degrees of subcool, we're stacking the right amount of liquid down in the bottom rows of that condenser. If we add more refrigerant, then we're going to get a higher subcool because we're stacking more liquid. We're, we're taking up space in that condenser with more liquid, which is raising our head pressure unnecessarily, by the way, which is then driving up that subcool number because subcooling is the difference between our condensing temperature and our actual liquid temperature. You're going to notice here that in this presentation, I'm not in this class, I'm not going back and teaching you how to measure subcool and superheat. Like uh, we're making an assumption that you know how to get these numbers. Um, but we are talking about how to charge a system in a smart way so that you really know what's going on in the equipment. So when you see subcool going up, it tells you that you're feeding more refrigerant. You're stacking more refrigerant from the bottom up in that evaporator coil. If you see subcool go down, that means that the amount of liquid in the bottom of that condenser is getting to be less and less. Make sense? Awesome. Actually, any questions from any of the, any of the students before I move on? Oh. <clears throat> no, but your discharge line should be normal operating 30 above ambient, correct? 30 above ambient. You're saying the discharge line temperature will be 30 above ambient? Yeah. Uh, not necessarily. I mean, like it can be significantly higher than that. Um, that's not going to be a universal. That's not going to be a universal rule at all. Um, discharge line temperature is you not going to be. You should know that, Chad. You've heard yourself. Enough. Yeah. So like <laughs> if it was only 30, yeah, I mean, that's a good example. Like if it was only 30 degrees over your outdoor temperature, your ambient temperature, you'd never burn yourself on it, right? Because you're not going to burn yourself on something that's 130 degrees. Um, so they what get your liquid line temp. Oh. oh, well, so liquid line temperature. Okay. So what you're probably thinking of is that your condensing temperature is going to be about 30 degrees above your outdoor temperature. So if you take your outdoor temperature, Say your outdoor temperature is 90 degrees, you add 30 to it. And again, this is for this is a refrigeration thing that those numbers are lower. Um, this is called CTOA, condensing temperature over ambient. So in refrigeration, you kind of your typical smaller systems, your CTOA is going to be around 30. So that means your head pressure uh, is going to be, if you if you go across the scale and look at that condensing temperature, that's going to be about 30 degrees above your outdoor temperature. If it's significantly higher than that, then you've got probably probably have a problem. And if it's significantly lower than that, you probably have a problem. That makes sense, but yeah. that's not a physical temperature of your liquid line or of your discharge line. That's actually the temperature at which the refrigerant is condensing inside the condenser. So if you were to shoot it with like a thermal imaging camera, um, if you had the emissivity set properly on it, which is always a tricky thing to do, but then that's where you would see that um, 130 degrees if it was hundred degrees outside. But again, your discharge line itself is gonna be significantly hotter than that. Um, up to, you know, and, and this varies a little bit, but the kind of the standard is um, <clears throat> uh, six inches outside of that, uh, outside of that compressor, you never want to see that exceed 225 degrees. When I say never, there are exceptions, but uh, generally speaking, you don't want to see a discharge line that's, uh, that's above 225 degrees. And in uh, grocery, this, that's this, a really this, good This discharge, today. this discharge temperature is like third degree burn, huh? Oof. Well, well, 225 will burn you. Um, eventually, but you do want to pay attention to that. If you're working on a rack house and you go through and you're checking discharge line temperatures and they're above that, those compressors are going to fail because that means inside the head, it's over 300 degrees and the oil is breaking down. So it's a very, it's something that I want grocery guys look at that discharge line temperature, because if your discharge line temperature is in, in range, it's, it's, they're consistent and they're where they're supposed to be. Um, your compressors aren't overheating at that point. Um, I mean, again, there could be something internally that's going on, uh, damaging the compressor, but it, you know, at that point, you don't have to worry so much about your superheat coming into the compressor and all that. That's a, it's a good kind of final test to, to take, go six inches out, measure that discharge line temperature. This has nothing to do with what we're talking about right now, but it's something right. that you ask. So I want to make sure that you know. So now we're going to talk about charging via superheat because it is one of the more challenging things to do. We don't have to do it that much anymore, frankly, uh, because most systems are uh, TXVs or electronic expansion valves now, but it's still a good thing 
to know how to do. And the first thing to know is uh, what measurements you have to take. So you need to take the indoor wet bulb temperature in the return. You have to take the indoor wet bulb temperature in the return in order to set your superheat. Um, and that is not an easy thing to do uh, because you can't do it with a regular thermometer. And some people will say, well, yeah, you can do it with a wet sock around or whatever. No, you can't. It's just, it, it's not, you got to use distilled water and it's just a whole thing. So use a proper psychrometer. You can use the field piece job link psychrometers. You can use the testos. Um, there's a 605 eyes, uh, what, whatever works, but use a, uh, a proper digital psychrometer in order to measure your uh, return air wet bulb temperature. So you got to get that. You got to get your outdoor dry bulb temperature in the shade, and then you got to use the charging chart to get the target. So you need those before you even know what number you're supposed to be hitting. Once you know what number you're supposed to be hitting, then you add refrigerant to decrease the superheat, and you remove refrigerant or recover refrigerant to increase the superheat. So add to decrease to fill the evaporative coil with more refrigerant, remove to increase the superheat to fill the evaporative coil with less refrigerant, but you can't do that unless you know what number you're supposed to hit. And you can't know what number you're supposed to hit unless you've done these other steps. Notice, um, or remember, I should say that you also have to have done all the other things that I already told you. So you have to check your evaporative coil. You have to check your air filter. You have to make sure that your airflow to the best of your ability is what it's supposed to be. Your condenser coil is clean, all that sort of stuff. So pay attention to all of those obvious visual things first. So much of what we do is becoming masters of the obvious, as Jim Bergman always says. We have to pay attention to the obvious before we start getting into the, to the fancy. Um, if you master the obvious, you, you're usually not even going to have to worry too much about the fancy because you'll find the, the dirty blower wheel that caused the problem in the first place. So I want to talk about weighing in refrigerant, um, actually how you add it. Because one of the, one of the biggest mistakes I see is people add the refrigerant in the same way when the system is running versus when it's not running. So I'm going to ask this of one of the students, if you have a system and you're going to weigh in refrigerant into the system, um, say you replaced a compressor, for example, and you're going to add charge to the system. How do you add charge to a system? So it's under vacuum. You don't have any refrigerant stored in the condenser because, uh, uh, uh because it's you not a, a liquid system. line, liquid line first, break the vacuum. And then what's, you know, it's up enough, turn it on and you can add to the suction. Okay. So, but, to the but why do you add, so here's the question. Why do you add to the liquid line um, when the system is off? So when the system is in a vacuum, why do you add to the liquid line? Why don't you add it to the suction line? If you add to the suction, you're just going to be flooding that compressor when you do start it. Exactly. Because it's going to go, yeah. Yep, exactly. You're going to flood the compressor when you do start it. Um, so you want to make sure, hold on, I'm just, uh, you want to make sure that you're never putting liquid refrigerant in any significant amount straight into the suction line. So when you're charging a system, when it's running, where do you have to add refrigerant? Somebody, anybody, where do you have to add Your refrigerant? Suction. You have suction. to add it in the suction. Why do you have to add it into the suction? What's the reason? You know, honestly, I've never knew the reason except, I mean, you know, through the cycle, goes through suction and your compressor, through the condenser, out. There's a very practical the reason why. Too great. Yeah, it's because the pressure's too great. The pressure's too great. Yeah, it won't go in. That's the reason why you can't add it into the liquid line when the system's running. It won't go in. So you can add it into the liquid line when the system's off because the pressure's, or, or not when it's off, but when the, um, when the system has no charge in it because there is no pressure. And that's in fact the only place you should add it. So you always want to add it uh, you know, into your receiver, into your liquid line, that sort of thing when you're adding liquid refrigerant because if you put it in the suction line, it's going to suck right back to that compressor when it turns on. But when you're charging the system, uh, when it already has refrigerant in it, the only way to do it is with it running into the suction line. But what do we have to do then? If we're going to add refrigerant into the suction line, what do we have to be careful of? Not Very adding liquid. it too fast. Exactly. We have to make sure that we're not adding it too fast. Why? You'll wash out the compressor. Yeah, you'll damage the compressor because we can't put liquid into that compressor. The compressor is not a liquid pump. You will damage it if you add liquid to the compressor. So... Let's go through some common errors, some common mistakes that people make. And we'll, we can talk through some of these as we go. There's a, there's a lot of them and probably some that I'm not thinking of. So 
uh, any of you on YouTube, if you want to add in some common mistakes that you, uh, that you see people make with charging. Um, the first one is inaccurate measurement. So inaccurate measurement can happen a lot of reasons, but one of the ones I see, especially when people are attempting to charge by subcool, is taking their measurement, uh, temperature measurement on the discharge line rather than the liquid line. And why do people do that sometimes? Why do people get the discharge line and the liquid line confused? Any thoughts on that? Hey, you might not have a liquid line service port if you're working on like a, I've worked on some residential units that don't have it. Yep. Yep. Because you don't always have a service port. So sometimes the manufacturer doesn't even give you the ability to really measure subcooling because they don't give you a port on the liquid line. If you don't have a port on the liquid line, you can't really accurately measure subcooling. There's no way to do it. You can take a stab at it. You can take a guess, but you don't know for sure. So you're measuring discharge line, which is fully vapor before it goes into the condenser, not the liquid line, which is fully liquid should be after it comes out of the condenser. So that's a common reason for an accurate measurement. Another reason for one. what's that? I said, I have a good one. Okay. What's another one? Uh, one, not purging your hoses. Yep. And the one Mississippi one ounce. So, you, you know people who do one Mississippi one ounce. Don't tell me. I don't know them. people. I've heard. I've heard about. Oh, okay. You've heard. You've heard. Uh, you've Allegedly. heard the rumor. It's like the great, yeah. like the great Florida skunk ape who uses one Mississippi. Yeah. So, um, and, and that was one of my next ones there. So, using a scale is absolutely necessary. You always, if you're adding charge to your system, you got to use a scale. Um, failure to purge was the number was the second one on my list, but I want to stay up here with inaccurate measurement. Still, what are some other causes of inaccurate, inaccurate measurement? One is, is for things like setting your superheat where you have to get your target. And I was going to, so actually let's back up here a second. Well, I won't back up, but I, I'll just talk it through. Um, when you're getting your target, you have to have your wet bulb and you have to have your outdoor dry bulb in the shade. So that means you got to have an appropriate tool to do that. And then you have to be using a calculator that actually works. Now, this is why I built this into the HVAC school app to make it easier. It asks you the question, you enter it, and it pops up. You can use an old school table and check it that way. Um, but if you confuse your wet bulb temperature with dry bulb, you're going to get a wildly wrong target. Another thing is if you take your outdoor temperature with a thermometer and you don't take it in the shade, you're going to get a wildly wrong target. So measuring in, either with an improper tool, for example, confusing wet bulb with dry bulb and the return, uh, or taking it a line of sight of the sun, for example, uh, is going to affect the measurement with radiant and it's going to give you a wrong number. So you're not going to get correct targets unless you take your temperatures in the right place. Also, you're going to get inaccurate measurements if you, do, if you fail to, at minimum, zero your devices. That's true of digital devices or analogs, making sure that they're zeroed out. Um, but then also a lot of these analog devices are only really accurate to within plus or minus five degrees. Um, by the time you figure out the parallax, parallax effect where it's parallax effect where it's kind of hard to tell exactly where the needle is, uh, as well as just the intrinsic accuracy of the gauge. And so in many cases with uh, non-digital devices, you may think you have five degrees of superheat when you have zero or you have 10 when you actually have five or whatever. You could be five degrees off very easily. So using modern digital uh, measurements, measurement tools is going to get you much closer to an exact number. Um, again, so as long as they're zeroed and they're functioning properly and they're of good quality, um, inaccurate measurement will kill you, especially when you're trying to do something that's really persnickety like setting a charge by superheat. Um, any others, any, any questions about that? Anything you want to add? Uh, no, but patience is a good thing though. Like, you know, you, you add, you like, oh, I got eight degrees, you know, sub cool. I'm done. And then, you know, but after it's kind of, you know, went through the cycle and then it's dropped, I think it's like, what, like 15 minutes, you know, after you add a little bit, 15 minutes, add a little bit. So, yeah, you want to, you want to definitely take your time when you're adding charge. Um, and that's, uh, that's right here. That's down on my list. Charging too much, too fast. Uh, that's a really big one. Oh. Uh, another thing is like with modern blended refrigerants, even 410A, although a lot of people over, uh, I had somebody tell me um, because I was telling them to purge when you're purging, just purge with vapor. And they're like, no, that's going to cause fractionation. It's like, come on. No, that, that's not 410A barely fractionates as it is. 
um, because it's a near azeotrope. Uh, if you were dealing with something that had a lot more glide, even then it wouldn't matter for the purpose of purging hoses. Um, but whenever we're doing working with blends, we're supposed to charge with a liquid. Uh, in the old days, when we were charging with R22, we would charge with vapor. It would go in very slowly and we could really, really dial in, especially when we were setting superheats. You would only charge by vapor and you'd really kind of, I mean, you get it close with liquid, but then as you were, you know, dialing it in, you would just use vapor and it would go in very slow. Nowadays, when we have to use liquid, I'm a, I'm a fan of using those little charging adapters and putting that right on the tank. So that way, when you when you are charging liquid, when you got the tank flipped upside down, it's going to help meter. It's going to create a pressure drop, so it's not you're not going to feed in so much so fast um, when you're charging on a running system. Um, but either way, you can just kind of be really really careful with your gauges, and you can watch the sight glass to make sure you're not feeding through too much liquid at once. Um, and that's the that's the whole flooding while charging issue as well. But let, let's not get off of an accurate measurement yet. Um, we'll finish there. Make sure that you're using tools that are accurate, as accurate as they can be. I'm not somebody who says you should never use analog, but if you're doing something that is very finicky, like maybe um, you know setting a superheat on a small, uh, small self-contained system or something like that, I would not suggest using analog gauges for that. And in fact, anytime you're using working on systems with very critical charges and especially very small charges, I would only use probes because you're gonna have a lot less loss um, for that. So I'd use digital probes uh, and digital thermometers. A failure to purge, especially over time. Um, and again, the, the, the less refrigerant in the system, the more air can really affect it. Uh, and the more you're hooking up and disconnecting. Now, I'm not a fan of gauging up all the time anyway. I think it's a bad practice. I think you get them set in, you profile them, and then you mostly use non-invasive testing moving forward to make sure that the system's working properly. That's a podcast for a completely other time, which I think we should, uh, our class for another time, which I think we should probably do at some point, uh, how to do non-invasive testing better. But if you are going to hook up hoses to a system, you do need to make sure to purge them. And I suggest purging them just with vapor refrigerant um, just to kind of keep the losses less. But um, you do need to make sure that you purge them. Uh, another common error is loss on connect and disconnect. Um, you're not going to have a lot of loss on the suction line because it's lower pressure and it's vapor. The liquid line is where you get a lot of losses. And that's why, I, so I suggest using ball valves on your hoses and I suggest on at least your liquid hose. And I suggest using a core depressor tool because that core depressor tool, you keep it completely backed out before you put it on. And so that way you don't have uh, any flow while you're connecting and disconnecting. And then you twist it in in order to open and close the Schrader uh, if you're using a Schrader. Obviously, if you're working on traditional service valves, you don't have to worry about that, right? You've got that full control. But as we know, when you're connecting and disconnecting on a liquid line with a standard hose, there's quite a bit of loss that can occur. And that can affect your charge, especially when you just dialed that charge in perfect and then you go take it off and it you know it gets stuck and you blow a bunch of charge out. Now your charge isn't what it was supposed to be. So I really like using core depressors on the liquid line uh, and ball valves on your hose. And then you just kind of ball valve it off and then you feed the refrigerant back in to the suction line that was in your gauge set. Now, again, on a critically charged system, that refrigerant that was in your gauge set may result in the system being overcharged. So you got to be careful even with that. Uh, but that's a that's a good standard best practice. Um, Chad already mentioned this, and it's one of the biggest mistakes that, that newer technicians make or impatient technicians make is uh, flooding during charging or charging too much too fast. Um, and, and not just so charging too much too fast isn't just bad because it can flood, but it's also bad because you can overcharge the Dickens out of the thing. Uh, because you're not waiting, especially when you have a system that has an accumulator. So think about this for a second. If you've got a system that has an accumulator in it, and the system's running, and you're adding charge into it, that refrigerant, that liquid is going into that accumulator, and it's just building up. And that has to boil out of that accumulator before it ends up in the system. So when you're charging an accumulator system, you got to put it in slow, and you really got to wait, because it takes a while for that refrigerant to make it out of the accumulator and cycle through the system. You can easily overcharge an accumulator system um, really, really quickly. Um, so don't charge too much too fast. Be slow, be uh, be deliberate. You know, watch that sub cool if you're charging a TXV system. Watch it go up a degree at a time. Don't try to don't try to get a whole bunch in right away. If you're charging it with that kind of standard, you know, starting run charge, what I will generally do is um, I'm going to weigh it in and I'm going to try to weigh it as close to the data plate um, as I can with liquid into the liquid line. Cause it's perfectly fine to put liquid in the liquid line. You're not gonna hurt anything putting liquid in the liquid line cause that's what's supposed to be there, right? So when the system has no charge in it, go ahead and just crank it open, run liquid into the liquid line when it's off. 
and then try to get as much in it as you can uh, in just the liquid line, then shut it off or shut off your tank, then run the system and then put it carefully into the suction line, carefully and slowly um, until you hit your target. And the whole time you're doing this, you got to scale on it. Failure to depress the Schrader is one of the most common errors that I see newer techs make. Um, and I see it in a lot of different areas, but I see it when they're trying to charge or when they're trying to measure. They, it's, they'll always say some version of, oh, it's not, I'm charging it, but it's not changing. Nothing's changing. I'm not, you know, nothing, none's going in, some version of that. Um, you got to make sure that it's actually pushing in the Schrader, uh, which means that you have to um, often adjust the core depressors on your hoses if you're using hoses or probes, because sometimes the core depressors get jammed in a little too far. Um, in some cases, you may even have to back out the Schrader a little bit in order to get them to engage because that core depressor has to go in and push on that uh, Schrader core in order to open the valve and to allow refrigerant in. That's another reason that having a core depressor tool on your truck is handy, especially when you have some of those Schraders that are kind of in there and tough to get to. So you do need to make sure, always make sure that you're depressing the Schraders. Another charging error that I see is folks mixing refrigerants. Um, either intentionally or unintentionally, regardless, um, you don't mix refrigerants in the field. So for example, you don't go to a system that's low on R22 and top it off with R407C or R438A or R whatever, whatever, whatever. You'll get a lot of people who will say, well, no, but the guy at the supply house said that it's a drop-in refrigerant. Drop-in refrigerant does not mean you can drop it in on top of an existing charge. It means that you can recover the existing charge and then put this refrigerant in in its place. And even that's not usually the case, um, but it certainly doesn't mean you can take and put uh, one type of refrigerant in on top of another type of refrigerant because it's going to mess up your PT chart. You're not going to know how to charge it at that point because now nothing's going to mean anything. You've got two different refrigerants in there. You have no idea what the proportions are. You're not going to be able to set sub subcoolant superheat because there's no refrigerant. No two refrigerants have exactly the same PT relationship. None. So when you take one, put it on top of another, it doesn't work. And also it's against EPA rules. They do not allow field mixing of refrigerants. Um, wrong charge method used. So, uh, and you see this a lot. People will, who get used to setting a charge by subcool, they'll show up on a fixed metering device system and they'll attempt to set the charge by subcool rather than setting charge by superheat. Always check both. I'm not saying that you only check one or the other. You check both when you're setting a charge. You're, you're monitoring your superheat. You're monitoring your subcool. You're monitoring your condensing temperature. You're monitoring your evaporator temperature. That goes back to that big old diagnostic chart that I'm always sharing, that big old PDF that shows you kind of where everything should be. You gotta be measuring um, what I used to call the five pillars. Uh, your evaporator temperature or suction saturation or suction pressure, whatever you wanna call it. Your head pressure or condensing temperature, which is what I prefer. Your superheat, your subcool. And then I used to say delta T. I don't actually care as much about delta T now um, as I used to but it's still a good thing to, to go ahead and check your, yeah, your temperature drop across your evaporator quote. So those are some things that you, that you definitely want to, uh, want to do. Uh, Ricky says quick charge, quick charge, I think is the name of that little uh, port that you put on the tank and that allows it to, um, that, that flashes it off, creates a pressure drop. So that way you don't flood the system. Um, but wrong charge method can end up with a messed up charge and a messed up charge can result in compressor damage one way or another. It can result in poor capacity one way or another, like we talked about at the beginning. Either way, overcharge or undercharge, both can equal compressor damage. Both can equal system inefficiency, meaning reduce capacity. It's not going to cool as well and it's not going to stay as efficient. The next is failure to use a scale. Drives me crazy, right? A scale is such an inexpensive, such a simple device and using it helps keep you safe when you're recovering. It helps you ensure that you're charging the customer what you're supposed to, not overcharging, not undercharging. And it also helps you keep track of where you're at. If you're putting in a ton of refrigerant all at once, um, that can be a, a, an indication of a, of a problem, of something else going on. We go back to our, our start here because these are really the things that you need to make sure you do before adjusting a charge. First things first, air filter, evaporator coil, blower wheel, condenser cleanliness, start with the obvious, then go into things like, hey, does it look like somebody swapped out this condenser fan with a different one and maybe put in the wrong one? Does it look like somebody put this fan blade in the wrong position? Does it look like, you know, is this a variable speed blower? Okay, is it set up properly? Did they land the wires on the right terminals? If it has a ECM 3.0, you know, kind of 
set up where you actually program it by the thermostat or controller, you're going to have to go through that and make sure that's set up properly for the right tonnage and everything. Um, and then just, you know, a lot of other obvious things like, and I didn't mention this, but another one is, you know, did somebody jam a, a filter into a, into a return grill that's not supposed to get a filter? That happens all the time, especially with tenants. Um, did somebody push a couch up against a, a, a return grill? Did somebody go through and shut off all the vents in their kids' rooms because the kids aren't staying there anymore? You know, all these things that can cause airflow problems, you want to go through and look at all of those. I mean, look at the supply and the return entering the unit. Do they look like they're vastly under, I mean, vastly uh, undersized? Does it look like somebody pulled out a two-ton unit and jammed in a four because somebody told them that would be better? And now it's running on, you know, really, really undersized ductwork. These are all things that you will find in the field. And if rather than doing this, you go and you start adding or removing refrigerant, you're going to result in a lot of problems. Um, that's mostly it as far as the core things. I want to go through and answer some questions. Any questions from, uh, from the students on, uh, on Zoom or anything you want to add before I move on to some of the YouTube questions? Yeah. If you need to add charge, leak search for sure. Okay, yeah, that's another another really good point. If you're going to add charge to an operating system, uh, make sure that you find the leak. Yeah, and and always start with visual there too. Start with, do you see any signs of oil? Look through everything, all your obvious points. You know, do you see signs of oil? Start there uh, before you um, just start adding charge to the system. For sure. For sure. All right. So let's see. Let's see what questions we have on YouTube. Um, well, some of these people are just saying nice things, you know, it's just so, it's just so boring. <laughs> Thank you for all the, all the nice comments. Um, Michael says you can close the ball valve on the liquid line and pull back refrigerant into the system. Yeah. And that's where uh, if you have a core depressor tool, or if you're working with a, you know, a, a, a multi-position um, refrigeration service valve, um, you can uh, shut it off and then feed that liquid back into the suction line so that you don't waste that refrigerant. Absolutely. Um, let's see here. Oh, my, uh, for some reason, my phone is not connecting to the internet now, so I can't read your questions. Um, when it comes to the practicality of time versus what we charge, our customers, I find many of our very specific practices are irrelevant. And then he says, I constantly struggle with diagnosing things property with the realistic ability to make money. So many systems need to be replaced. Profitability is a real thing. Um, uh, yeah, that's true. But keep in mind, you're not talking to somebody or with somebody who doesn't understand the balance of profitability. Um, there are a lot of teachers out there who get super unrealistic about how this all works, but I'm talking to you right now as somebody who has worked in this field for 21 years. Um, at Kalos, we have 250 employees, and obviously we wouldn't do that if we weren't profitable. So you can be profitable and you can do it this way. Um, it does require that you, um, you prioritize. So that's a, a, a good technicians always prioritize. The things that you need to prioritize, though, are things like these things. These things here. And these are things that because if you pay attention to them and the blower wheel's dirty, guess what you do? You quote the customer for it and they pay you to clean it. Now, a lot of people say, oh, my customers won't pay for that. Well, sure they will. They will if you tell them that it's something that is a priority. If you're just going in and replacing single parts or just adding a few pounds here or there, I mean, I'm not knocking you. I've done it. I was there and I felt exactly the same way you feel early on. Um, but the reality is if you get better at diagnosing the whole system, spending more time with the customer and then offering them solutions that are bigger and they're going to cost more too, then everybody's going to be happy because you're not going to get callbacks. You're going to actually make this equipment work better uh, and you're not going to have to be rushing all the time. That's the secret to the profitability side of this business. Um, so I don't want to be condescending, um, but a lot of people think that like, hey, I'm in such a rush, I can't do all this. Well, being in a rush makes you unprofitable. Slowing down and diagnosing everything and quoting the customer and then having them pay you to do all of that, that's what makes money. And before you say my customers won't do that, 
sure they will. They will once you get more comfortable communicating about all these things and not just fixing one problem every time you show up. If you only fix one problem every time you show up, you know, you're, you're going to really struggle. But if there are more problems with the system, if the system has an evaporator coil leak and a dirty blower wheel and a dirty condenser, then yeah, they're probably going to want a new system and that's fine. Um, and it's fine to offer people systems. That's perfectly fine. As long as you're not telling them that's what they need, right? We give people options, but be thorough. If you're thorough and you give people options, then you'll do well. Proper maintenance. Uh, yeah, proper maintenance. That's huge. I mean, a lot of what we do is um, is maintenance. A lot of it is cleaning. Um, let's see here. Oh, somebody asked if they can stop by the Kalos office and get a picture. Sure, absolutely. Feel free. Um, as long as I'm there. I'm not there all the time. So uh, let's see. Um, uh, how much temperature? Uh, how much does temperaturize mean to you? And what's a good average? So we say temperature rise. Um, I, it depends on what you mean by that. Um, you could mean delta T. So you got to be specific about what you mean by temperature rise. Um, but yeah, all of it's valuable as long as you use it in conjunction. There's no one measurement that's going to answer every question. You've got to take a battery of measurements. So for a system that you've done a major repair on or you've just installed or it's the first time you've ever worked on it, superheat, subcool, uh, suction saturation, i.e. evaporator temperature, i.e. suction pressure, um, liquid line pressure, which means condensing temperature. If you look at the, you know, you look on the PT chart at the scale, um, Delta T that's the difference between your return and your supply temperature. Um, it's a good, good one. Uh, compressor amperage is a good one, especially if you're experiencing compressor issues. But beyond that, um, on a, on an older system, things like testing your capacitors, making sure that those are, uh, where they're supposed to be, whether you're doing an under load test or you're disconnecting them and testing them with the meter, you know, look at common things that commonly cause breakdowns, drain lines, you know, stuff like that. Those are the sorts of things that you um, should be doing regularly. Uh, and those, those matter most. Again, you're trying to prevent problems. Uh, authentically, we need to be preventing problems for our customers. People will pay us to prevent real, to, to fix and prevent problems if we're really doing it. It's the techs who go and just take a bunch of readings and don't do anything with them or just bang around in the attic and make a bunch of noise or try to put on a show. That's what frustrates me. There are really there are really real things you can do to equipment to make it work better. And setting the charge properly is a huge one, but there's a lot of others uh, that we also need to pay attention to. Um, Eddie says, I always have to charge when I go to a new system that was installed in winter. Um, it, it sounds like, so if a system was installed in the winter time, setting the charge can be challenging. Now, if it's a heat pump, um, a lot of manufacturers give you heat pump charging guidelines. They're nothing like these, uh, what we've been talking about here. They're specific to that manufacturer and you would need to read it specifically. Um, another thing to mention, and this is just popped in my head, is that with micro channel condensers now, um, even charging subcool is getting a little more uh, challenging because the subcooling changes depending on the uh, conditions. And so you actually have to look at the manufacturer chart on that as well. Also, micro channel systems generally come with less charge in the condenser because that condenser coil can ho hold less charge. Um, which brings us to another point. There was a period of time where everybody kept making bigger and bigger condenser coils and they were still using uh, the same technology and that meant more refrigerant in the system, which in and of itself isn't a huge problem, but the more refrigerant you add to the system, the more costly they are to recharge and the more likely you're gonna have flooded start problems because the more refrigerant is in the system, the more refrigerant there is to potentially condense inside that compressor during the off cycle. And so a lot of manufacturers have gone to reducing their charge sizes. And one of the ways that they've done that is going to microchannel. Um, I'm like most techs, I don't like microchannel because it leaks. Um, and it usually leaks because it got impacted by something. It's just much more sensitive to damage externally. Um, so I don't love it, but one advantage of microchannel, uh, if it can be properly protected, is that it doesn't hold as much refrigerant. But the downside is that makes it a little more, uh, a little more challenging to charge initially. Um, so yeah, back to Eddie's question. Uh, yeah, it, you know, you can, on a heat pump, you can set the charge in heat mode to some degree, but really if you're installing a system in the winter, um, it really comes down to just weighing the charge in properly, just doing a quick run test and just make sure that it runs. Uh, but if it's really cold outside, you're not gonna effectively set the charge. Um, you can use to some degree um, with TXVs, you can use the field piece charging jacket, 
And so you put that over the top and you adjust it and you can set the subcooling that way. But at that point, you're probably better off just, um, you, you can do that for a run test, but really just, just weigh it in appropriately, depending on your line length. We do have a line length charge calculator on the HVAC school app too. So if you don't have that app, it just makes it, we're basically just following um, it's manufacturer guidelines, but it's really just the amount of refrigerant it takes to fill additional um, lengths of, of uh, refrigerant line set. You still have to look at the manufacturer guideline as far as the amount of line length that it's initially charged for, because that's not always the same across all brands. Um, so weighing in is weighing in is big. Greg says you must price yourself right. And that is true. Uh, most business owners, especially small business owners, get in trouble because they put some moral imperative on pricing um, because uh, you know a lot of us have come from uh, from places in our lives where we didn't have a lot and we were uh, you know 100 bucks meant a lot to us uh, i've been there you know I, <laughs> I lived in a 1500 square foot trailer with eight kids um, so i know what it's like to not have a lot of extra income or a lot of extra money sitting in the bank account um, but the reality is in order to run a, a business uh, you have to price yourself uh, in a way that that's appropriate for the service you're providing. If we go around feeling sorry for our customers because they don't have money all the time, um, then you're not going to have a business that, that works for you. And so you have to price yourself uh, appropriately. And based on what we know and what we're able to do, um, it shouldn't be cheap. If it's cheap, then it's not valuable. And uh, that's, a, that's a big thing. So it, it is a good point. Um, Charles says, why do you, why do you not care about Delta T tells you issues with airflow? Correct. Um, the problem with Delta T, Delta T is a really moving target. Delta T depends on a lot of things. Um, it depends on the exact match of evaporator coil to condenser. It depends on the exact airflow setup of your particular unit. Um, and so that is helpful, but not all units have the same exact airflow profile. Uh, and then it also depends on um, what your, uh, what, what the dew point of your air is, what the relative humidity of your return air is. So it, it's a moving target. I've done a lot of articles on it. Um, I perfectly fine to take. I'm not saying don't take it, but I'm just saying that a lot of people will say, oh, you got a 20 degree split. That's good. Not that simple. You could have a 20 degree split and have massive airflow problems. You could have a 20 degree split and have uh, perfect, you know, it could be perfect. You could have a 20 degree split and you could be very overcharged, you know? So it's it's a it's a good measurement if you use it in concert with everything else by itself it's it's not it's not perfect um let's see here uh it says maintain old systems the two ball thickness on new condensers evaporators are paper thin and leak in 10 years you'll never achieve roi uh, he says ROE, but I think that's R ROI is what he means, um, return on investment. And that is true. Um, I, I am unhappy with the trade-off between efficiency and longevity. Um, even for people who are, are really concerned about the environment, I mean, I'm concerned about the environment too. I, I'm not saying I'm not, but people who are really focused on like green technologies, one of the best green technologies is making systems that don't break all the time. Because when you make systems that break, then they have to be recycled. And there's a lot of energy that goes into that. And the refrigerant leaks out. And so if you really are concerned about venting of refrigerant, make evaporator coils that don't leak. Um, <laughs> that's, that's the message that I give to manufacturers. Uh, and so I agree with you completely. Um, let's see. Somebody asked pricing for 410A. We're not answering those questions. That always goes downhill, Pricing specific pricing questions. Um, uh, let's see here. Does anybody clean blowers as part of their maintenance? Uh, yeah, so there are uh, different levels. And so I strongly suggest that you have different levels of maintenance, some that include blower cleaning and some where it's an add-on. Um, that, that's a pretty standard way that a lot of companies do that. And that's the way that we do it. Um, let's see here. You need to be thorough in order to prevent callbacks. This is from Michael. Uh, you know, you've checked everything so that you do get a call back. It won't be something you missed. Uh, exactly. And when you're talking about charging a system, um, you have to do all of your due diligence beforehand to ensure that um, it's not something other than charge. That's, that's the main thing that I really want to get across here is that a lot of times people will add refrigerant to a system because they're trying to get the suction pressure up. Well, 
it, I mean, it could be charged, but it could be a lot of other airflow problems too uh, on the uh, on the evaporator coil. Anything that causes low airflow over your evaporator coil is going to cause low suction pressure. So pay attention to all of that first. Everything you can pay attention to, do that first before you start messing with charge. Now, again, for those of you who know how to measure superheat subcool, suction saturation, uh, liquid saturation, and delta T, based on those, you can know whether the problem is airflow or is charge. Um, but I still, you still need to look at all that stuff anyway, right? I mean, this is part of running a, we talked about profitability, it's part of running a profitable business. Because if you go to the customer and you say, Mrs. Jones, you have a leak and it's here. And then you fix that and you're like, oh, in addition to that, you have a plugged evaporator coil. And then you fix that. And oh, in addition to that, you have a dirty blower wheel, right? I mean, it doesn't make sense. The customer wants to know everything that's wrong with their equipment. And I'm, I am, of all people, not the one telling you to make things up. I'm just telling you, you need to look at everything. So if you need to look at everything anyway, just go ahead and do it at the beginning before you even uh, start adding charge or removing charge or doing anything. And it will save you a lot of heartache. Um, let's see here. Everybody's still hearing me okay? It looks like I'm having some issues on, uh, on YouTube. I don't know. It could just be my phone. Um, Greg says, you get in a bad cycle of pricing a job low to get it. Then you need the next one. Uh, then you need the next one due to lack of money. And that, that, I mean, that's very true. That's a cycle that I was certainly in early, uh, early in the business. And the other thing is when you're the cheap guy, you get all the crap jobs too. That's, that's another thing I noticed. I mean, it's like every job I was doing, I was getting attic jobs and all that. And sometimes that's just being newer to business. Um, but yeah, you gotta, you gotta get your pricing right. You gotta, uh, and if you, that's something you don't know how to do, then definitely um, get a coach, talk to some people who are experienced business folks who are successful and, uh, and they'll, they can show you how to do that, but it's, it's necessary. Um, you don't want to get into this, into this cycle of robbing Peter to pay Paul. It just gets, it gets crazy. It's totally crazy making. And again, I've, I've totally been there. Um, let's see here. I think that's most of the questions. If you have any other questions, you can, um, you can post them in the, uh, in the, in the YouTube chat. Um, and also, uh, students, anything comes up, uh, we're going to start wrapping up here. A couple other things. And these were in some of the slides that I wrote and then uh, they disappeared off of my, yeah, I had, a, I've learned a lesson on PowerPoint that uh, you don't want to share too much between com <clears throat> computers because they overwrite each other. Anyway, um, one of the other things that I wanted to mention is this concept of filling the system with refrigerant. Um, really what we're trying to do, if you imagine a system that's off, um, we, want, we want enough liquid in that system so that when it starts up, it recovers quickly. So that way we get that <clears throat> liquid seal at the bottom of the condenser because liquid because discharge gas goes into the top of the condenser and it cycles down and becomes liquid at the bottom. And the evaporator coil, liquid goes into the evaporator coil, starts at the bottom, and then goes up to the top, boils up until it's fully vapor at the top. That's how they're all piped. Um, but really, the goal is we don't want to have extra, um, we don't want to have extra liquid um, hanging around that we don't need that's just sitting in our condenser. We want enough so that we get the subcool we want and that we fill our evaporator coil appropriately. Um, a lot of systems are overcharged. Uh, and a lot of systems have small leaks, and so they end up going into kind of the undercharge um, spectrum over time. Uh, but that's that's really our goal. And once you recognize that, and you're taking readings, and you're trying to get to that point, um, uh, this is all going to make a lot more sense because it's not just a matter of hitting numbers. I mean, the manufacturers can kind of make you think that after a while because you're just used to all right, hit this sub goal, hit this superheat, right? But it's it's actually quite simple what you're trying to do if you. You don't want to superheat too low because you don't want to overfeed. You don't want to superheat too high because you don't want to under, over, uh, underfeed your evaporator coil. You don't want to subcool too low because that means that you could get to the place where you're not actually getting liquid to your metering device. You don't want to subcool too high because that means you're stacking too much liquid and it's driving your head pressure up for no reason, which decreases your system's capacity. Um, another thing, and uh, let's see, Chad posted this, and this is a good one. If you are charging a system with blends, and so we're going to get more and more blends moving forward. Um, 410A is a blend, but you can still charge it as though it wasn't a blend. You don't have any significant glide. I think it's one-tenth of a degree um, glide, so it doesn't really matter for what we do. But if you are charging blends, you're going to work with something called bubble point and dew point. 
And the best thing that you need to know, because it gets a little confusing, I've done lots of videos on this if you want to learn more about dew point and bubble point and midpoint and what that is. But here's what you need to remember. If you, you use dew point for superheat and you use bubble point for subcool, and the way you remember that is duper heat and bub cool. Duper heat and bub cool. Now that I've said it, you're never going to get it out of your head. So you use dew point for superheat and you use bubble point for subcool. If you're using something like measure quick, it automatically does that. You don't even have to remember that, right? But if you are going to, you know, manually pull up a PT chart or you're going to use the scale on a gauge, um, then you need to know that if you're measuring superheat, you need to use the dew point number. And if you're doing subcool, you need to use the bubble point number. And uh, that can get a little, that can get a little tricky. Um, so just remember that. All right, any other questions? Any of the students? Again, let's just finish off by going over our list of common errors, things you don't want to do. Make sure that you're measuring accurately. Generally speaking, that means nowadays, if you're trying to dial it in, use digital tools um, and make sure that you're taking your measurements in the right place. Don't try to you know, do subcool by measuring on the discharge line. It has to be on the liquid line. Don't forget to purge. Get all the air out of your hoses. When possible, don't use hoses, and that will reduce on the need to purge, and it will reduce on losses. Um, consider using a core depressor on your liquid line so you have less liquid loss. Um, don't flood during charging, so don't add a bunch of liquid down your suction line. You can use something like quick charge. I think is what somebody said it was called. Um, a little port so that it creates a pressure drop. Put that on your tank or at your gauge to help meter it through or just throttle it really carefully. Also, don't charge too much too fast. You're gonna end up overcharging it. You're gonna hit your number and you're gonna be like, I'm good, but then it's gonna keep running and then your subcool is gonna keep going up and then you're gonna be overcharged. Make sure you're depressing the Schrader. That means making, you know, you can make adjustments to the quarter pressure on your hoses or you can just use that separate quarter pressure. <coughs> um, you're also gonna tend to have more losses on connect and disconnect if you have messed up old seals or if the height on your quarter pressure isn't right. So on your hose, on the end of your hose, you want that quarter pressure to be pretty much even with the edge of your seal in most cases. That's usually uh, the right place to, to put that in order to reduce losses and to also make sure you push that core in. Don't mix refrigerants, just don't do it. Don't mix them in your recovery tank. Don't mix them in your system. Uh, just don't mix refrigerants. Uh, don't for, you know, make sure you're using the right charge method for the unit. Obviously, if you're charging in a heat mode on a heat pump, it's different. If you're charging a TXV or an electronic expansion valve, it's usually going to be subcool. Um, keep in mind nowadays with microchannel coils, that may be a number that you have to look at a chart rather than a single fixed number. So pay attention to that. Uh, and then don't forget to use a scale. Use a scale when you're charging, use a scale when you're recovering, make sure you got extra batteries for your scale. Heck, make sure you have a backup scale. They're not that expensive and it really saves you uh, a lot of heartache by using, by using a scale. And, and again, a big part of efficiency is keep things together. So keep your scale by your tanks, by your gauges, keep them all together or your probes all together. So when you grab one, you grab the other, right? You grab your tank, you grab your, you grab your uh, scale with it. If you get in the habit of doing that, then it's not hard. Same thing like flowing nitrogen while bracing. People say, nobody does that. It takes so much time to do that. It doesn't take time at all to do it. You just have to make sure that you've got it all together. You know, So every time you pull your torches off the truck, just pull your nitrogen off with it. Right? You're gonna pull it out later for pressurization anyway. So it's just a matter of practices. When you get used to doing things the right way, then it's not hard. It's hard when you're not used to it and you gotta make that transition uh, to doing it the right way. All right, I think that is it. I think that is uh, that is today's uh, that's today's class. Uh, hopefully, you enjoyed it. Thank you to everyone who uh, interacted on YouTube. Thank you, students, for uh, for being here, showing up, and uh, yeah, have a good one. We will uh, we'll see you again uh, quickly. Uh, Want to mention actually a couple things. Um, the symposium is on. Uh, so, if those of you who are interested in attending our technician training event. It is uh, gonna happen again. It's gonna happen in February of 2022. It's up on the site. Um, it's hvacrschool.com slash symposium. If you wanna find out more, get your tickets, all that we're gonna do similar to last year, but we're gonna do it better. We're gonna have better live stream, better cameras, all that kind of stuff. So um, so take a look at that. Also, uh, we have a new app up called MechPick, M-E-C-H-P-I-C. MechPick is designed for sharing uh, great images uh, from our trade. 
Uh, I've put pretty much, uh, it's not my entire library yet, but all of my best images are up there that you can download. A lot of the ones that I use in the presentations. Of course, I had a lot more in this presentation that then didn't end up in it, but uh, you get the point. You can find those all by uh, downloading the free MechPick app. And then you can also contribute by uploading your own images and it automatically puts your name on it. So that way, uh, if other people use it or share it or use it for training, then you, everybody can remember who uh, who first took the photo. So it kind of is a little, just a fun way to help others uh, with great uh, images and illustrations for a trade for training purposes. That's called MechPick. Uh, and then there's something else that I wanted to mention too. The symposium's coming up, MechPick. HVAC school app, if you haven't downloaded that, um, you know, the superheat calculators in there, as well as the line length calculator, like we mentioned, also free, no strings attached, literally no strings. There are no strings at all in the app. Even if there, even if I want, even if you wanted a string in the app, you're not going to find one because there's just no strings. You know, it's like, it's like Pinocchio, you know, I've got no strings to hold me down to make me fret or make me frown. I've got, well, no, how does it go? I had strings, but now you see I've got no strings on me, something like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I bet you didn't know I was going to uh, sing a Pinocchio song on this class. All right. I see everybody taking off now. Thanks for coming. We'll see you next time on the HVAC school class thing. <laughs> see ya.